Thank goodness you're here, Doctor. We have six sick patients, and we have the drug that can cure them, but one of them needs all of the drug, and the other five need a fifth of it each. None of them have any families or anybody who will suffer as a side effect of them dying. There are no special circumstances, the one isn't about to negotiate world peace or anything, and they're all strangers to you. But we can either save the one or the five. Doctor, what is your decision going to be? Most people would say that it is better to save the five, and maybe even stronger, it would be bad if you didn't. But John Torek has a different idea. He says, look, suppose you are the one, and again, the drug is yours, so you need to decide what to do. If something is better, then it must be better from the point of view of somebody, or relative to somebody's goals. It doesn't make sense to say that something is just better from the point of view of nobody. If you are the one, then it is not better for you to save the five, probably, because if you save the five, you will be dead. You value your own life higher than you value the lives of those five people, so it is better for you to save the one. But here's the rub. Say you're not the one, you're a separate person, and again, the drug is yours, so you need to decide what to do. By the same principles as before, if you value the one's life highly enough, like they're your partner or your best friend or something, then it could be better for you to save the one. You do not have to save the greatest number. Now, we might say that five people dying is surely worse than one person dying, but Torek says, well, worse to whom? Remember that each one of the five represents the loss of one life which is the same loss that the one will incur if they die. There is nobody who loses five lives. We can't actually add that loss together. Furthermore, this would still work whether it was one versus five, or one versus five thousand, or one versus five billion. If you value the life of the one highly enough, then you can choose to save them, and none of those five billion will have any rights to complain or say that you should have done otherwise. Not a lot of people would agree with Torek and say, yeah, it's okay for you to save the one and let the five die. Maybe if the one meant a lot to you, like if you were Spider-Man and you've got to save either Mary Jane or the school bus full of children, it's okay for you to save Mary Jane, but if it was Mary Jane versus all the people in New York, or Mary Jane versus the entire world, then at some point the numbers get big enough and we say, okay, actually it would be bad for you to save Mary Jane. But Torek says again, bad for whom? If you choose Mary Jane and everyone in New York dies, all of those 8.5 million people, then there's nobody who loses 8.5 million lives, everybody loses one life, which is exactly what Mary Jane stood to lose. And even if they all have families that miss them, nobody will collectively miss 8.5 million people. So if you love Mary Jane enough, and if you would miss her enough, then your love could outweigh the loss of any one of the individual mourners, and it could be better for you to save Mary Jane. Derek Parfit has a reply. He says that we can actually consider the bird's eye view here. Five people dying is a worse state of affairs than one person dying. Torek talks about value to people, but Parfit talks in terms of value of people, and five people are worth more than one person. But I think Torek could reply to Parfit that if we're talking about what state of affairs it would be better to bring about, then we are still talking about value to somebody, namely Derek Parfit. If Derek Parfit thinks that it would be better to bring about a state of affairs in which one person dies rather than a state of affairs in which five people die, well then that's a scenario that is more valuable to him. And if he means that it would just be more valuable objectively somehow, from the point of view of nobody, then I think Torek could fairly say that that doesn't really make sense. It doesn't really make sense to say that something is objectively valuable, valuable from the point of view of nobody, because if it's valuable apart from anybody valuing it, well, then isn't that just the same thing as it not being valuable? Now, we might say that it's just more fair to give the drug to the five 
rather than the one. We've got these six patients, and each of them have an equally strong need of the drug, so we give everybody's preferences equal consideration. The one's preference does count, and it cancels out the preference of one of the five. But look at that, we've still got four preferences in favour of giving them the drug. If you like, we've got four votes in favour of doing that, so we give them the drug. And since we end up with one-fifth of the drug left over, and it's no good to the one because they needed all of it, we can just give it to the last remaining patient. We've solved the conflict scenario, there's now no reason not to save that last person. That seems fair, but does equal consideration really mean balancing contrary preferences? It's not really that fair if the one never had a chance of getting what they wanted just because they're in the minority. So if we really wanted to be fair, we would give everybody's preferred outcome an equal chance of occurring. Which means that we should flip a coin. To decide whether to save one or five, or one or five thousand, or one or five billion, flip a coin. And that is exactly what Torek recommends. Flip a coin. Heads, one person dies. Tails, five people die and everyone's preferences are given an equal consideration. That might seem pretty flippant, you might be like, whoa, these are people's lives here, we can't just make this decision based on the flip of a coin, but remember that the moral thinking that has gone into making this decision has been anything but flippant. The flipping of the coin is just the mechanism that we use to decide. We have given very serious moral consideration and made sure that everybody's preferred outcome has an equal chance of happening. Now I think there's a slight problem with that. For each one of the five, their preference is that they individually are saved, not that the five collectively are saved. So if we really wanted to give everybody's preferred outcome an equal chance of occurring, we'd need a six-sided coin, or probably a die. We roll the die. If it comes up one, then we save patient one. And if it comes up two, then we save patient two. But here's the cool thing. If we save patient two, we've still got four-fifths of the drug left, and that's not going to be any use to patient number one because they needed the whole syringe. But we've got four people over here who might really need it, so we can now give the rest of the drug to them. We've gotten rid of the conflict scenario. There's no reason not to save them now. Their number didn't come up, but if you like, they've won by proxy. What we've got then is a tactic for eliminating conflict scenarios, which gives everybody's preferred outcome an equal chance of happening, but will statistically favour saving the largest number, which most people would intuitively say is correct. A philosopher called Jens Timmerman came up with this in 2004, and I think it's pretty bloody good. So just to give another example, say you're the captain of a lifeboat, and you can either save one person or a hundred people. What you should do is spin a wheel with 101 names on it. If it comes up with the one, you go and save the one. If it comes up with any of the 100 people, then you go and save that person. But because you're now over there and you can't save the one, they're out of reach now, there's no reason not to save those 99 other people. Of course, if it comes up with the one, then you will have to go and save them, and you will have to let 100 people die. If you did otherwise, then you wouldn't be treating everybody equally, which you would have to justify. Like I said, I think the individualist lottery is a really good bit of philosophy, but that could be because I know Jens Timmerman and he's a legend. So what do you guys think? Is Torek right that you can choose to save the minority? Do we need something like the individualist lottery to decide what to do? Next time, we could either do should prisoners get the vote, or if you think we've been political enough recently, especially with next week's video coming up, which is going to be about the Human Rights Act, we could do art and forgery. For more philosophical videos every Friday, please subscribe. Last time we asked, does the future exist? So let's see what you guys had to say. Fisky Firen said that the whole question is actually dumb and pretentious. So that settles that. That's all the time we've got this week. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you in the- No, I'm just joking with you. <laughs> Penny Lane said that if we subscribed to presentism, which is one of the views we were talking about, according to which only the present exists, then we could get around the problems that throws up by saying that the past and the future do exist, but they exist in a bit of a different way than the present. And that sort of idea has been tried. Thomas Crisp was a philosopher who had an idea according to which the past and the future do exist, but they are abstract objects, and uh, It's Man of Popsicle had a very similar idea in the comment section. I was actually going to talk about that Crisp idea in the video, but I ended up not having uh, time. <laughs> um, but uh, 
yeah, I don't, I don't think it really works. It inherits all of the problems with abstract objects, which we've talked about another time, so I'm not hugely convinced by Crisp. Jason Phillips said that what makes the sentence T-Rex was 40 feet long true is that its bones exist in the present and they can be measured. There is evidence for that statement being true. But the problem for the presentist isn't so much that there's no evidence, but that they can't really make sense of what was means. Zidnaf asked, why can only things that exist make statements true? Well, if things that don't exist can be truth makers, then we're gonna end up with contradictory true statements. For instance, the statement I have two legs is true because my two legs exist. But if things that don't exist can be truth makers, then it is also true that I have three legs because of my third leg that doesn't exist, and I have four legs because of my fourth leg that doesn't exist, and my fifth and sixth and seventh legs. So it is both true that I have two legs and that I do not have two legs. And those kinds of contradictions are the things that we need to avoid. Zhen Kung Ku had quite a sophisticated idea. They said that to make statements like T-Rex was 40 feet long, isn't actually to talk about some animal T-Rex which exists in the past. What you're doing there is laying down the application conditions for the concept of T-Rex. What you're basically doing is saying, if you're talking about something that isn't roughly 40 feet long, then you're not talking about a T-Rex. Whatever it is you're talking about, it's not that. And that's actually quite a clever, sophisticated tactic that the presentist could adopt. I actually really quite like that. Uh, David Volusch and Hank Schrader also had similar ideas in the comments section. One problem I can see with that is that we wouldn't be able to distinguish between statements about things that we think really existed in the past, like T-Rex, and things that we think fictionally existed in the past, like Atlantis. So we could tell similar stories about what the application conditions for the concept of Atlantis are, but we still, on that model, wouldn't really be able to distinguish distinguish between the things that we think actually existed in the past and the things that we think people thought existed in the past but didn't. Lucas said that truth doesn't always depend on what exists because Batman is Bruce Wayne is true even though Batman and Bruce Wayne don't exist. Well, of course, that idea does require you to say that Batman is Bruce Wayne is a true statement, which is by no means an uncontentious one. I've actually done an episode on that and fictional characters before when I did a collaboration with Dylan Dubow and I actually used that very example. So it's not entirely clear whether that's actually true. Similarly, Jack Greenwood said that there are statements like two and two make four, which are true, but not true because of anything that exists. And yeah, I think you're actually onto something there. What I should have said, sorry, I should have been more careful, was that uh, empirical statements if they're true, are true because of what exists. Empirical truth supervenes on existence rather than analytic truth. So I'm sorry about that, that's my mistake. Was Abraham Lincoln is King of Mars a reference to Adventure Time? You're glob damn right it was. That's all the time we've got this week. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next episode. Bye! I think you should keep the outtake of your purpose. It wasn't filming. Damn it, no. None of that was being filmed. I didn't, was I didn't even have the recording on. There were, all, there were loads of outtakes of me burping. But it was perfect. I'm sorry. It was, conditions were perfect. Conditions were perfect. <laughs> Why? No, because you, you burped right as you said, you called this. What? Like, um, you were talking about weekends, Timmerman called something and you called burp. You called it burp. Rick. Rick, Mort, Morty. Oh jeez, Rick. Oh jeez, Rick. I don't know if I can solve the Tim Romanian individualist lottery. <laughs> <laughs> um, this line needs to get moved. <laughs>